This morning, Sunday morning, we have the great pleasure of having back with us once again William Henry from Nashville, Tennessee. His most recent project, which he's going to talk to you about this morning, is The Secrets of the U.S. Capitol, and I like to look at it as what Dan Brown could not or would not reveal. So without more ado, I want to welcome William Henry to the podium. Thank you. We're going to get into it here by talking about the U.S. Capitol as a dome of ascension. You, you tune into the news every night. You, you, you look at the U.S. Capitol. Most people can recognize the building. Most don't have any clue about the artwork that is in the dome of the U.S. Capitol and that, in fact, it was conceived of as a temple, in fact, a temple of enlightenment, and that it is actually a dome of ascension. So before we get into the Capitol, let's just take a brief tour here of some of the domes around the world that the Capitol is actually a mirror of. It doesn't matter whether we're at the Hagia Sophia or if we're at the, uh, at the Palladium or if we're at uh, the Dome of St. Peter's, the Vatican, if we're in... Uh, the, the dome here in Michigan, if we're in any church dome around the world, domes are always places of connection with the divine. Domes are considered to be wombs. They're wombs of transformation. And when we enter a dome, no matter where it is, it is considered a sacred space, a sacred space that connects us with the higher energies of the heavenly realms. And when we start to look at the United States Capitol as a sacred space, we begin to recognize that this was the true vision of the founding fathers, that they in fact viewed it as a dome of ascension. And what I have been looking at is that when we take out the word ascension and put in the word stargate, that the, the concepts just directly correspond. So that in fact, when we're looking up at some of these domes and connecting with a divine being, most often, in, in, of course, in Christian churches, you're going to see Jesus in the dome, that what we are doing is tuning our consciousness into this higher realm. And the dome itself is a model of what we today think of as a stargate or a portal into the heavenly realms. This is uh, the, the state capitol in Maine. This is the state capitol in Texas and Austin. This is the state capitol in Michigan. And when you're in these places, this is the Temple of Science in Washington, D.C. When we're looking up into these domes, we're recognizing that we are essentially divine beings. And these domes encode the secrets of how to awaken that divinity within us. And especially the dome of the United States Capitol, I think, is the, is the ultimate dome anywhere on the planet that encodes the secrets of ascension. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's talk about how the dome came to be. Uh, the new high dome was literally constructed during the Lincoln administration. During the Civil War, funds had grown short, and the Congress thought that maybe we shouldn't uh, commit the funds to constructing the dome. But Lincoln insisted that this new high dome be constructed as a symbol of the Union. And I love this painting here. It's by Alan Cox. It's in the House Wing of the Capitol. It portrays Lincoln almost in a magician-esque kind of pose, literally willing that new high dome to rise. And of course, it's kind of poignant because it was his assassinated body that was laid in the rotunda of the United States Capitol that established that site as hallowed ground even to this day. We have photographs of the construction of the new high dome during the early 1960s, excuse me, 1860s. You see the pillars emerging. You see the, the dome itself beginning to rise. And it had to have been an incredibly magical time. I mean, you're thinking the backdrop of the Civil War here. It, it was a bread factory at that time, and it was an infirmary at that time. And it had to have been a, just, a, a, just a powerful feeling to be there to watch this dome rise until finally in 1863, the dome is completed. The Statue of Freedom, the goddess of America, is placed on top of the dome, and it's now seen for all eyes to see as the Great White Mountain that we see in D.C. today. This is the painting that was done by Thomas Eustick Walter, the Philadelphia architect, a watercolor. When Congress saw this painting, they were mesmerized by it, and they instantly committed the funds to the construction of the dome. Thomas Eustick Walter, of course, was intimately familiar with sacred geometry knew what he was doing when he was constructing the dome as a sacred space using sacred geometry and intended literally for this to be a, a, a rival to St. Peter's Dome, to St. Isaac's Dome. All of these were inspirations for the, the creation of the new high dome on the Capitol. And it was Walter's interior revision that introduced this monumental mythological painting that suspended over the oculus or the eye of the dome the painting is called The Apotheosis of George Washington. And what we've done in Freedom's Gate is gone into the Library of Congress and collected some of the earliest photos of the apotheosis. This happens to be from the 1870s. 
This is from the 1930s. And then when Dr. Wallen became curator of the Capitol in the 1990s, her first mission was to restore the apotheosis, to clean it up. And so today, we are privileged to be able to look up into the dome from the view of the rotunda at this magnificent painting in all its just incredible glory. The, the word apotheosis is Greek. It means to deify, to raise from a man to a God-man. And what we see in this painting is George Washington surrounded by angelic beings sitting on a rainbow, and he's also surrounded by other mythological figures whom we'll talk about in just a moment. This is an amazing painting because it literally is saying that, that Washington is a deity. And that is perhaps a strange thought to us in our time, but in, during Washington's time, as we're gonna see, it was a common thought that Washington had actually raised from the dead, that he was in fact a deified being, a Christ-like being, if you will. That's a very strange thing for us to kind of contemplate today that Washington was thought of as a messianic figure, as the savior of the country, as he was called by Brumidi, the painter. But that is, in fact, how they viewed Washington during his life. And when we start to look into this painting, I mean, there have been analyses done on this painting by Dr. Wallen and others, and they point out that, that Washington uh, is portrayed as a deified being. They leave kind of the rainbow out of it. They don't talk too much about the angelic beings that surround him, and they certainly don't discuss in detail the, the pagan gods that surround Washington. But once you start to get into this, you realize that, wait a minute, this painting, the apotheosis of George Washington, could be well be one of the greatest alchemical icons ever in human history. And that's my perspective, and that's what we're going to discuss later. This, of course, is the goddess freedom. She's the freedom fighter. She is our, the defender of spiritual liberty. She's one of my favorite characters in the apotheosis. She, she wears the, the getup worn by all the spiritual warriors, as noted in the book of Ephesians. She wears her helmet of salvation, indicated by her starry crown. She holds the sword of God, she's the shield of God. She wears the breastplate of righteousness. And if we could see her feet, I'd bet she's wearing the sandals of peace. This is the, the garments, the, the clothing worn by all the high spiritual beings and tells us that freedom is in fact a defender, not just of earthly freedom, but she's also intended to be the representative of spiritual freedom as well. This is Poseidon on his seahorse holding his trident or his pitchfork. This is Aphrodite beside him, all figures drawn from Greek mythology or Roman mythology. This is Mercury, who's one of the primary gods of America, holding the caduceus wand, a symbol that is repeated more than a dozen times inside the United States Capitol. When you look at the caduceus from the alchemical perspective, we're told that that is the symbol for transformation. And so here we have Mercury, the god of travelers, the god of spiritual travelers, the god of transformation and alchemy, handing a bag of gold to Robert Morris, the financier of the American Revolution. And when you look at this and you put it together and you say, well, if Mercury or Hermes, as he's called in Greece, is the god of alchemy, what kind of gold exactly is he handing to Robert Morris? the financier of the revolution. And you put that together with the research I've done in southern France and Rennes le Chateau in particular, where Benjamin Franklin was studying, where Thomas Jefferson was studying, where the Knights Templar were manufacturing white powder gold. And you have to ask the question, again, what are we talking about here? Is it possible that we're talking about alchemical gold? And so here's Mercury's caduceus wand, again, all over the United States Capitol, very powerful symbol.